thank you for being here. So let's dive right into it. Okay, here are just some things that I personally see. That's what's going on in the velocity banking and infinite banking space. So 2024, I've been watching a lot of high level entrepreneurs, content creators, different gurus that touch on the macro financial economy in the United States. And many of them are in alignment saying that we should expect some sort of financial crisis in 2024. Now, what that would look like, in, in my understanding, for average everyday Americans that say don't have a business, okay, you don't have a business and maybe you're not you know, investing a whole lot of money yet, maybe you're not really in, in real estate, but you're someone that has a career, has a job, maybe you have a home, a mortgage, you got some debts. I think a financial crisis that's going to affect you the most, those that have jobs or careers, the, the biggest thing that would affect you is either real estate prices going down, so you having less equity in your home, which would mean less access to leverage in the event that you need some extra money, see that, or a potential job loss because businesses, major corporations are, are hurting, banks hurting, the commercial space hurting, and they're going to release, lay off people to lower their overhead, keep their stock prices at a decent you know, rate so that they can keep getting funding from the investors. So on a macro to micro level in terms of your personal household, your economy, for people right here, most of us watching this channel, right? I know most of my audience are not entrepreneurs yet, but desire to be, or don't have businesses yet, but you desire to have a business. And right now your main focus has been building up your credit, building up your savings, paying off debt, becoming a better steward over your finances, building that discipline. The biggest threat in 2024 to you is specifically losing your job. And so I think there are some tactical, logical moves that we can make as employees to increase yourself as an asset more than a liability to the company that you work for to reduce that chance of you losing your position, number one. And then two, considering acquiring a new skill, right? Or, or honing in on some skills you already have, but doubling down or potentially pivoting into a new industry that you might actually enjoy doing that might actually end up paying you more money, right? All these different things. I believe is gonna be very, very relevant to those that are watching right now, catching the replay, right? For the, for the entrepreneurs in the room and the business owners like myself, I believe, especially those business owners like me that are B2C, you're marketing directly to customers that feed your business. So in my case, I'm a content creator, I'm a consultant, I'm a, I'm a coach, I have courses, I have programs, different things like that. And this is how I generate income. So I create, I create valuable content, on social media, teaching people how to, you know, learn these strategies, say velocity banking, infinite banking, debt snowball, uh, becoming a better steward, knowing your numbers, how to stay cash flow positive, all these very, very helpful things completely out there for free. I have a monetized YouTube channel. So the more people that watch my channel, the more potential revenue I can make through monetization. That's one stream of income. Then that viewer, Say so you guys, loyal people watching, 25 people in the house right now and increasing, those that are very, very loyal, you subscribe, you, you've been getting value from the free content, content, some of you, then take the next step and you fill out a contact form or you get a hold of me, you email me, you say, hey, I want you to help me, I want you to help me in my finances. And then you invest in yourself, in me, hire me to help you, boom, that's another stream of income. Then I help you, right? We draw out timelines, we do a whiteboard session, we map out the numbers, we help you get out of debt, we help you increase your credit, uh, increase cash flow, become a better steward, do all these things. Then you get to the point where you're like, hey, I think I wanna you know, get into the social media content creation space, or uh, I'd like to start this business, or I'd like to get a cash value life insurance policy. Boom, another stream of income for me there, right? And it keeps stacking and stacking and stacking. Well, if there's a financial crisis, I can, potentially see a either decline in people investing in themselves, say new clients, it'll be say slightly harder, maybe more difficult to acquire more clients because people simply don't have the money. What I'm doing personally in my business, and hey, this might this may not apply to everyone's business, but maybe some of you in the room here, and I've, I'm 
rolling out a, a service in 2024. And this is something that I did in 2020, but not publicly. Like I didn't publicly like just put it out there. It was more of an internal process, but basically I'm going to be naming it. This is like my public process system. I already announced it to my private community in Finance Geek Ministry, which is a ministry of finance that helps people you know, get their finances in order. And I do that completely for free, right? Just like I do on the YouTube channel, but I'm live. So the program I'm going to be rolling out in 2024 is really help now pay later. Okay. And this program really applies to people that say maybe we're doing good, but then they lost their job. So say, for example, you got a husband, wife, and wife loses her income. So now it's just husband and there's a 50 percent drop in income in the household and so they were doing okay they were watching the videos and then they reached out and they say hey Zell, i just lost uh, my job now it's just husband working it's increased stress we, we see ourselves you know going into more debt someone like that would totally qualify for the help now pay later which is basically saying hey i'm willing to commit to you now in exchange for some social currency right? In exchange for some social currency. And I will help you in that tough time, right? Help you find a new position, help you uh, mitigate your, your household expenses, like go over everything, analyze everything, take that time. And I'm willing to exchange social currency, or we set up a pay later program where it's like, okay, uh, my services are X. Okay. You can only afford this. Got it. So you either pay what you can, or we drop a a covenant agreement that just says, I commit to paying you X at this later time once we get back to a positive cash flow position. And we'll declare what that number will be and then we go from there, right? So this is a service for my community, you guys, those that watch the channel, those of you who are practicing these concepts, you're doing velocity banking, you're doing infinite banking, you're on a roll, doing well, but then something happens in your economy. You know, there's a loss of income, a death in the family, a major medical expense that just really drains you. And you just need that support, whether it's just someone to communicate with, someone to run numbers, run ideas, run strategies, all these different things. So that's going to be my personal solution for what I see coming in the marketplace. So those of you, again, you're practicing the velocity banking concept, you are in the process of acquiring your line of credit, a credit card, a HELOC, a PLOC a business line of credit, or you're in the process of funding a life insurance policy, whatever it is, in 2024, I expect very similar like what happened in 2020, right? This is all over again. So when COVID hit, 2020, banks were consolidating. So from 2020 all the way to 2022, we've seen a lot of banks either go under, go bankrupt, or they got consolidated, bought out by someone else, right? I think we're going to see another round of that going into 2024 and then, you know, maybe even 2025. So I, I think we're going to see more banks consolidating or shutting down, shutting down branches, which means job loss for average Americans that work in those industries. We saw in 2020 banks tightened lending. They made it harder to get approved for certain things. They lowered the amount of credit that they were willing to give compared to say 2017, 2018, 2019, or banks that were offering HELOCs, PLOCs completely, they, they stopped offering it for a period of time. They withdrew their HELOC product. They withdrew their PLOC product. They were no longer offering it. And I think this would be, this is going to be a positive for velocity banking users right now, you guys that are practicing the concept. I do believe we will start to see rates decreasing. There's already been a lot of content already put out that we might see the Fed decrease rates six times and, and people were like, okay, well, how much is in those six times? And people were guessing 0.25% each time. So I don't know if that would occur in one year or over the over a longer period of time, but that is the information that we've seen publicly. And it's been said so many times over that the Fed is planning on decreasing rates at least six times, 0.25% per rate decrease over a period of time. I do see rates decreasing or flattening, like just staying the same. Now that will positively help those that are doing velocity banking. Mm -hmm. This is going to uh, really make HELOCs more attractive for those that acquired mortgages in 2022, those that acquired mortgages around 
this range going into 2022, 2023. 2023, those of you who acquired a mortgage this year might probably you're around this interest rate, amortized rate, and you may acquired more equity in your property going into 2024, right? Or depending on how much you've paid down, whatever that may be. So let's just say that's you. Then going into 2024, we start to see rates decrease. We're going to see banks doing like more intro rate offers that look really attractive, right? So we might see more 1.99 to 4.99 intro rate offers anywhere from six to 12 months on HELOCs, right? So that's gonna be very attractive. So those of you who locked in six to 8% mortgages and the car loans, right? At these higher rates. And if there's enough equity built up in your property by 2024, it's gonna look quite attractive to do this concept. Whereas in 2023 and 2022, we saw rates going up. So we saw rates increasing. And then we started seeing a lot of questions. So my myself personally, with new clients that I'm that I've been working with in 2023, one of the biggest, you know, objections, concerns was Denzel, I have this mortgage that I got at 1.9%, 2.93, less than 4% mortgage in 2020, 2021, and then maybe 2022, like these very, very low rate mortgages, low rate car loans. And then they're just now discovering Velocity Banking in 2020. And they're like, dude, uh, this bank has a HELOC at 10.5%, 11%, 9.5%. I'm having a difficult time making sense of borrowing from 9.5%, 10.5% to pay off a 3% fixed amortized mortgage or a 2% amortized car loan, right? Me personally, this is, this is me, just my own personal opinion. I'm actually agreeing with those clients of mine. Yeah, maybe this doesn't make sense. I mean, we, we can clearly run the numbers and we could we can force Velocity Banking to work, but if we compared it to extra payments, the result is just not that attractive. You know, maybe we're three months ahead, two months ahead, one month ahead, or four months, six months, not that attractive. And unfortunately, we're seeing more content put out where and to me this is just inefficient you, you really won't see my case studies on my channel you really won't see me talking about you know using velocity banking with a 10 percent or higher key lock to pay off a super low amortized loan you really just won't see that major gap there is a point in time guys let me be very very abundantly clear there is a point in time where velocity banking does not make sense, right? That the math just doesn't play out when you try to take a very, very low rate mortgage, especially if you've been paying on it for the last five to seven years and you've been making extra payments. Chances are low rate mortgages, there's not a whole lot of interest left on that debt. So it's very, very, very important that if we're going to try and do this concept that we are running the math two and three times over, getting a, a professional opinion, running it over with someone, hey, take a look at this, like really evaluating how these, uh, how the difference looks between an amortized loan, a simple interest, HELOC, PLOC, credit card. So in 2023, there were more cases this year, people I work, clients that I work with, where Velocity Banking just didn't make sense. And so I showed them how to just make extra payments. We used the cash flow index formula and we just did it old school and we got plenty of results. So I'm the type of content creator that isn't Velocity Banking or nothing, right? I'm not that kind of content creator that it's like Velocity Banking till death do us part. It, it always makes sense. Like, I'm, you're not going to hear me say that. You're going to hear me say, how do we actually combine both that snowball and velocity banking? Where maybe in the beginning, we're doing velocity banking, get us a boost on those credit cards and that car loan. And then maybe we do velocity banking for like two or three chunks on the mortgage. But then eventually we stop because it just simply makes more sense to just apply extra payments or don't pay it off at all. And we direct our attention towards the top line, increasing our income, right? So I'm always going to be presenting 
options being very very transparent in how we're how we're looking at things with our with our finances right so recapping going into 2024 big overall thing i do see a financial crisis coming i do see a lot of people losing their job their jobs their careers or husband wife someone you know getting a, a decrease in in income or reduction that's what i see on a, on a big level banks consolidating banks tightening lending again right and rates decreasing so it'll be a little more difficult to find that HELOC product because I think banks will just not offer them or remove them off their product list for a period of time. But the banks that do continue to offer them, they're going to get more attractive in 2024, especially for the person that has been preparing themselves. You've been doing all the right things with your numbers. You've been a good steward and paying down debt. You're lowering your DTI, you're increasing your credit score, you're looking more attractive to the banks. You're gonna find some really unique opportunities to lock in a very, very low intro rate on a HELOC, six to 12 months, and you're gonna be able to accelerate that seven, eight percent car loan, accelerate that mortgage, and that's where there's gonna be a flip where Velocity Bank is gonna look really attractive. So there's times where Velocity Banking will not make sense in certain economies, and that'll, that'll provide some pushback. And this is healthy pushback in my opinion. When I first started in 2018, 2019, Velocity Banking was looking amazing, right? Because mortgages were still, they were, they were a little bit higher, right? And it wasn't until like 2019, 2020, 2021, where we started seeing the rates drop tremendously, right? And we also saw HELOCs dropping. So those of you that are watching that acquired a first lien HELOC and you locked in a low 3% fixed rate for three years, five years, you locked in a 5%, you locked in a 4% for three to five years. That was very, very smart on your part. So you got to enjoy a fixed HELOC line of credit, simple interest at three, four, five ish, almost maybe five and a half percent for 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024, 2025. So your rate's gonna expire in 2025, or if you locked in the three year, you kinda already expired either in 2023 or going into 2024. So you, those people that were used to that low rate HELOC, uh-oh, now your rate just jumped to nine and a half percent, 10 and a half, guys, Remember, we don't have to stay loyal to the bank. We don't have to stay loyal. If you're in a position right now where you have a $150,000 HELOC, a $200,000 HELOC, $250,000, $100,000, and you owe 30, you owe, say, less than half percent, less than, less than 50% is owed on your HELOC, and you went from a low rate, three, four, five, and now you're at like nine and a half, but you've been with that HELOC. You've had that HELOC now for three to five years. I would absolutely consider going to a different bank right now and you can find HELOCs, other banks that are offering these intros for six to 12 months, anywhere from as low as 1.99% to four and a half, five. So we can dramatically reduce your interest costs. And that's like, hey, that's a that's an easy move right now. For those of you who already have your HELOCs, those of you who have been rolling with your personal line of credit and that has increased and you use your you've used your p-lock for the last couple of years to accelerate your car loans accelerate your credit cards accelerate some student loans and now you're just left with the mortgage you may want to consider graduating to a home equity line of credit and then you may want to consider okay do i want to pay off this property early or do i want to start that business have some capital to leverage at a low cost of borrowing and get that business up and running and start serving people, right? And now we're increasing the top line. So you may wanna consider that, right? So those are my thoughts and predictions on velocity banking, what I see happening right now. In the, uh, I, and, and I also uh, wrote this here, an increase in credibility. So I've been seeing more content creators talk about the velocity banking concept, whether positive or negative, doesn't matter. But that is drawing more credibility to the concept, the theory, the strategy, the method itself. I am also seeing banks welcoming this concept. I'm seeing banks create marketing that's attracting people like us that understand how to offset interest. They understand how to take a 8% rate and pay less than 2% when they're paying off a 5% car loan. So they're able to bring, you know, that 
8% HELOC down to two, and that's how they can justify paying off a 5% car loan with an 8% debt tool. That's how they can justify that because they're like, well, I'm actually paying a net true cost at 2% to pay off this five. And then when we ran, when we run extra payments, you're paying a net of say 4% or three and a half. So you're able to say, I'm gonna go faster with this and I retain liquidity along the way in case something in case something happens. I need to reaccess the money that I just applied for the toward the car because an emergency happened. This person's a little more secure, a little more safe, as opposed to the person that's just sending a bunch of their cash flow to knock down debt. If an emergency happens and they don't know how to borrow in the first place, typically they're going to get the worst loans. They're going to get the worst products, right? And end up paying more interest in the long run because they were initially just sending their a lot of their free cash flow towards debt of the nation, but then had, you know, life came up. So they didn't have, you know, access to that money again. <clears throat> so those are important things to be aware of. You guys know this. This isn't an, uh, an advanced session. I'm not really going into like, what is this? What is that? So if you're like brand new and you're like, what the heck is this guy talking about? This is probably not the, the video for you. This is more so for my clients. This, this video is more so for people who are seasoned. You understand these strategies, you know what's going on. You're doing it for yourself. Those of you that are brand new that are watching, really just take the predictions that I'm seeing right now and you can you know, apply that into, into your notes. But I'd recommend definitely watching some of my starter videos, watching the case studies where I really break down these strategies and how they work, right? So moving right along in the infinite banking world, right? Infinite banking concept, which is tied to whole life insurance, okay? I see some positive things happening in the space that I think will be helpful and might provide somewhat of a challenge for, for agents, but I think overall it'll be, it'll be good in the long run, is dividend rates increasing. So we've seen, those of you who have whole life insurance, we've seen from 2020 till now, right? We've seen dividend rates decreasing and we've seen guarantees decreasing, right? So I'm just gonna erase this right here and go into what I've been seeing in the whole life space. So if you're someone that has a whole life insurance policy and you acquired one between 2018 and say 2020, you probably have in your whole life insurance contract, you have a 4% guaranteed rate, more than likely. If you're working with the major mutual life insurance companies, there's really a handful of life insurance companies that work well with this strategy and working with an agent that understands how to design a high cash value life insurance policy. So those of you that did that from 2018 to 2020, you probably have a 4% guaranteed rate. And then on top of that, maybe you were getting an additional one to two and a half percent non-guaranteed rate. So that's the, the dividend. So your gross rate, some of you are probably anywhere between like five and a half to six and a half gross rate. But then those of you from 2021 till now that bought a whole life, your guaranteed rate decreased. So in the life insurance industry, the life insurance companies lowered their guaranteed rate that they're paying to policy holders. So that rate dropped as low as 2% to 3.75%, as well as the non-guaranteed dividend rate dropped slightly so it's it was you know we're we're still seeing i i'd say no more than 6.1 percent i believe was like is like the highest gross rate that i see that i've seen with uh life insurance companies and maybe around this range but then although these people bought life insurance policies with the lower guaranteed rate what also happened was your your insurance expense on whole life uh, decreased. So cost of insurance decreased, which means that even though you're getting a lesser rate of return, your money was actually going a little bit further than the people who got policies here with the higher guaranteed rate because they had a higher insurance. So someone with a $1 million death benefit from 2018, 2020, it would cost them more money to get that $1 million. <clears throat> Say a 40 year old, right, male, versus the 40 year old male here, they can get that same $1 million, but for, for less 
insurance costs, and they're able to overfund their policy with more dollars. So someone with a, a $1 million death benefit, and let's just say their, their MEC limit was 50,000, so the max they could overfund it was say that number, versus now, same $1 million, this is not accurate, I just wanna get the point here, that same 40 year old male with the newer policies, that same $1 million, they now have a MEC limit of 75,000. Same exact policy, same exact company, same death benefit, everything's the same except for the, the MEC limit amount increased. So you, you could make the argument that if this person actually were to pay in that 75K on that $1 million death benefit, they would have a higher cash value performance long-term than the person that's funding 50K simply because there's more dollars going in even though they have a lower guaranteed rate. So that's what we've seen so far. Now here's what's really cool and I've been you know, watching people like Chris Kirkpatrick, Life 180, shout out to him, and Caleb with the And Asset, people like Garrett Gunderson, and other very, very knowledgeable people in the space as it relates to life insurance. Some of them have been saying is like, this is actually like the perfect time to buy life insurance because the, the, way it's, the way it's internally designed from the insurance companies, again, your insurance expense is now less for the same amount of death benefit. So if you were, say, an older individual in your later 50s, and let's say, so let's use, let's say someone that's 50 years old, let's say in 2018, 2020, you only qualified for the million dollars, and so you could only pay in the 50 versus now that that client that said, oh, you know, I want to be able to pay in 75,000 a year, but they only qualified for a certain dollar amount because of their health, whatever the case maybe, or their age or whatever it is. Now they can have that same death benefit, but be able to pay in more money, getting them closer to that desired amount. And because the insurance expense is now less, the performance of that 75K over the long haul will perform better. So those two things are in the favor of the customer right now for insurance companies. Now, if rates decrease going into 2024, I believe we will see dividend rates. So just imagine your dividend rate increasing with your whole life insurance in a properly designed high cash value life insurance where the insurance expenses has been lowered, even though you have a lower guarantee, but that non-guaranteed rate we can see that, we potentially see that increasing. So it just makes it very, very attractive. And I believe the way life insurance companies are able to provide that is because of the, maybe the bonds that they're locking in right now at higher interest rates, right? We're starting to see CDs, savings accounts, money market accounts, and bonds. We're seeing the rates have increased because interest rates have increased. So those insurance companies are locking in those higher uh, payouts, higher rate of returns for say 10 years, 20 or whatever, however that works. And in the general account of the life insurance company, they're out able to pay out a higher dividend to their policy holders. So I see that being a, a very good benefit for policy holders today. And those that already have had policies for a while, we'll, we'll all get to participate in that together. So I'm excited about that because if you are someone that bought a policy like myself between the years of say 2018 and 2020, you were initially given an illustration from your agent that you would earn say 6% or 6.2%, 6.5%. But then every single year you saw the dividend rate decreasing every single year, which means that the illustration that you got provided by your agent is no longer matching what's actually in cash value, right? And I've, did, I've, I've done videos with my own cash value life insurance policy where I showed people, where I was like, here's my original illustration and here is an in-force illustration based on how it's actually performing today. And it was like a few dollars off where it was less than what was initially illustrated. And that's because the insurance companies paid a lesser dividend rate. So you may not be the happiest customer from say 2018, 2020, and then even going into 2021, 2022, 2023, dividend rates have been going down. But now those of you who think long-term with your life insurance policy and you 
continue to fund them and manage it properly and not over borrow and over leverage yourself, get ready, you're about to enjoy an increase, especially if we see rates decrease. We'll see those dividend rates go back up because lending will be easier in the commercial space. I don't consider this bad news, but because of social media and the way these concepts can be misrepresented, over-exaggerated, sold improperly, and these concepts have, have had a reputation of hurting people, right? That's the reality, is in the velocity banking space, in the infinite banking space, it has a reputation already of people like myself, I'm putting myself out there, people like myself, content creators, gurus, uh, coaches, anyone that's promoting velocity banking or infinite banking, we have to deal with the fact that there are bad apples, bad actors that are misrepresenting these concepts, these methods, these strategies, these ways of, of thinking, ways of handling your finances. And that has hurt people that weren't ready for this strategy. One of the biggest things in the infinite banking space, whole life insurance, cash value life insurance, high cash value life insurance, becoming your own banker, all these wonderful marketing uh, terms that we content creators use. One of the biggest pushbacks from the anti infinite banking crowd, what they'll say is, Hey, we, we don't, we don't like that. You guys are, you know, pushing this product on low income households, people that only have an extra $300 a month, $500 a month to, to save. Like they don't have a whole lot of cash value. This is, this product is being pushed to lower income households, average Americans that don't understand this. Number one, they are thinking short term. They're misusing this product and it ends up hurting them more than helping them. So that's the biggest pushback that they're like, this should only be really, you know, promoted to the higher net worth people, people, higher income careers like doctors and lawyers and white collar, those that are making six figures plus, those that have really good cash flow, a couple thousand dollars a month. I actually agree with them, right? It's it's not often that I work with clients that are making 30, 40, 50 grand and we put a life insurance policy in place designed for high cash value, high cash value. Very, very rare. The only reason why I would help someone that's making 30, 40, 50 grand a year is if they have a spouse, someone else in their household that's making six figures or something like that. And they want to put a life insurance policy on their children, a couple hundred dollars, you know, a month or a couple thousand a year, small policies on their children or a $10,000, $5,000 policy on themselves. But they have very good stewardship. They have good amount of savings good credit, good discipline. I go through these qualifications to, to really say, okay, uh, I'm willing to work with that person. But for the person that, you know, and I work with a lot of these types of clients that are making the average American income salary and they want to jump right into infinite banking because they saw all the phenomenal content that's talked about it, but they only have $200 a month to spare, $400 a month to spare. And I'm like, hey, those dollars will work more efficiently if we target debt right now, rather than try to do this whole thing where we dump money into the policy and then borrow it out immediately, pay off debt, and do all these, you know, finesse and finagling, which could absolutely work when there's more capital to work with. But when there's not a whole lot of capital to work with and you don't have the discipline, you don't have the knowledge, typically those things can blow up and fail, right? And that's not fun. That's not fun. So regulation coming soon for insurance agents, where agents will not be able to use certain language when promoting, say, this strategy or talking to their prospects on the life insurance product itself. Someone like Chris Kirkpatrick, Life 180, he's, he's created a lot of content talking about regulation coming for agents, something like a AG something. It's called AG something, and uh, he's very, very into the protocols and, and properly representing these these strategies to to folks, setting proper expectations. An another good channel to, to watch is IBC Global or Caleb or Garrett Gunderson. These are very good channels that are consistently putting out content about life insurance and they're setting proper expectations realistic projections on how these things actually work and how it can benefit you long term. And again, I also see an increase in credibility coming to the infinite banking space, but then simultaneously, I do see some regulation coming as to 
how these strategies are represented because again when enough people get hurt financially some of these people band together and they start reporting certain agents to the proper institutions that launch investigations and then you know it, it takes a long time but eventually we see that come in and that's going to help get rid of some of the bad actors and that's going to help really weed out those that weren't even ready for the product anyways and then those that are are going to be able to you know enjoy how these things actually work for them personally those are my predictions on velocity banking infinite banking let me know your thoughts in the comments what you think about this this was valuable to you some of the moves that everyone should be making right now on to my left here if you are someone right that you're trying to pay off debt, trying to do better moves with your money, be a better steward. If a crisis comes, are you prepared? So here's my thing. Here's my personal opinion that if you're in the process of paying off debt and you're learning about how to you know, manage your money, do all these correct things, great. I think what you should have on your priority list right now is to have six months worth of expenses outside of your debt tool. So those of you who are practicing the velocity banking concept already, you have your HELOC, you have your credit card, you have your line of credit, PLOC, business line of credit, whatever it is, you should have six months worth of expenses outside of the debt tool. I know many of us move our savings into our line of credit and you've been accelerating. Great. I think you should also have money outside of your velocity banking strategy and that will add an extra layer of protection. Again, this is your personal preference, right? You don't have to do that. I personally, if I'm doing velocity banking, I always have cash elsewhere in my in my case it's it's in my cash value life insurance policy so when I'm combining the two together I make sure I always keep cash off to the side that I'm not incorporating into the strategy itself so when you hear me talking about velocity banking I often say hey you know max leverage two-thirds you often hear me say two-thirds or 66 percent max leverage of debt tool, right? So if I have a $100,000 HELOC, I really shouldn't borrow more than $66,000. I really shouldn't owe that much more, right? I like to keep 30 to 40% space in my line of credit and in my cash value life insurance policy. So me personally, in my velocity banking and infinite banking strategy, I have a cash value collateral line of credit. So that's my velocity banking debt tools, cash value collateral line of credit. The credit limit is 261,000. I owe 67K, right? So if we're doing the math, 261 times two thirds, 172,000. So 172,260 is my max number. Don't leverage more than that, right? That's how I, this is how I manage my personal finances, right? So that's my cash value line of credit. Well, on the IBC side, coming over here, I have 358,000 in cash value, of which I secured 261,000 as a line of credit. So 358 minus 261 is $97,000. So there is still, right, so if we did this, three, 58 times two thirds, 236,280. That's, that's two thirds of 358. So when I got my line of credit, I did the same thing and it made, it made, it still makes all this extra space. So this 97 is emergency fund. I'm not even incorporating that 97 into my velocity banking plan. So again, I, I only owe the 67, the max I will go is this number. In reality, I could go as high as this number, 236, 280. I just choose not to do that. I choose not to leverage myself that heavy. So in addition to the 172 of space in the 261, I also have 97 as emergency, not even incorporating it into the strategy. This is what you guys should be, you should be creating this type of tiered protection when you are leveraging debt, right? And this is the biggest pushback for people that are against leveraging debt, that don't see the value in leveraging debt because they see all this risk, which again, I totally agree with them. I'm like, yeah, if you are afraid of leverage, if you don't understand how to leverage debt to create more income or to offset interest, 
I don't think you should do this. I think you will mess up. I think you will make mistakes and it'll hurt you more than if you would have just did the traditional method of paying cash for everything, saving money up first, and then deploying it once you've created the capital. But for those that are taking the amount of time required to learn about leverage, how to create positive arbitrage, how to create more income, how to offset interest, and all these different moving parts in your finances, you ought to create protection from yourself. So this is how I protect myself from ever uh, over leveraging. So again, total amount of money saved from 2018 to 2023 this is how much money i've saved total and then there's earnings in that number as well so i save money instead of saving in a savings account i save it in cash value life insurance that money grows protected i have a death benefit i have a living benefit which is my cash value got the cash value large enough to then go to a bank create collateral now i leverage that collateral to do different moves i'm never going to leverage more than this amount right I'm always going to keep six months worth of expenses to operate. This is more like, this is like 10 to 15 months worth of expenses for me just in here. Before I even tap into that, I have this between 67 and 172. 172 minus 67, right? 105. Plenty of space there. Create this for yourself. Very, very, very important. For those that are practicing velocity banking or infant banking in 2023 and going into 2024. Very, very important. Have six months worth of expenses outside of your debt tool, preferably don't have to do it. That's just my personal recommendation. I think it'd be of value. I also would get a 0% credit card that you can just have on hold. You don't have to use it, it's just there. Like for example, I have a Bank of America credit card, 0% and it's always for like 12 months. It's just there. Balance transfer fee is 3% and the uh, credit card credit limit it's like 30,000 plus or so. Every single month, when I tell you every single month, every single month, Bank of America sends me mail saying, hey, you have X amount of space in your credit card. You can use this balance transfer, save money on debt and all this stuff. I, I barely ever use the card, but I keep it active. And I just know that if I was to burn through all my savings, right? Like stuff, you know, life got real bad. Okay, I burned through the savings, I burned through the policies, burned through it all. I would still have $30,000 of additional capital and space to help me through that really, really, really challenging time that I would be in. So I think it's very, very smart for you to have a 0% credit card just that you're not even using. It's just off to the side, it's there, you know it's available, I could you know, tap into it or I can, uh, you know, that, that means you're applying, getting approved for it and it's just, you just have it, right? And usually the bank gives you 90 days or so to leverage the offer. So it's nice because if you foresee a crisis coming into your house over the next couple months, right? If you can potentially see that coming, well, that gives us the, the period that we need. And then guess what? If no crisis comes, great. Card's still there. It's available. And then typically they send you mail and they give you the opportunity to use it anyway, right? So oftentimes they do that. Increase skills and build strong relationships with folks. If you figure out how to increase your skills, you're going to become more of an asset to your company, to your peers. Increase this, decrease liability, right? Increase yourself as an asset to the company, decrease yourself as a liability by increasing skills, building strong relationships within the company, higher up management, letting them know you want to win in 2024. <clears throat> How often does the boss, the manager, the regional district manager hear that from a lower level employee that they want to win this year? How often do they hear that, right? Why not it be you? Even if you're not in the desired career that you want to be in, you can share with them your goals and dreams and desires, especially if you're in a very if you're in a decent environment, I get if you're in a toxic environment, then, you know, if you're if you're in a toxic work environment, guess what you can do because you live in a free country. Uh, you can pivot and leave. The Denzel, you know, I'm making all I make this money. Okay, so you're chasing money or you're you're relying on money and not your faith, right? So that's a challenge. Where it's like if you're in a toxic environment where you're not able to grow, you're not getting raises, you're not being treated properly. Like I have some clients, they know who they are, where I've told them so many times over and over again, I said, you have got to pivot out of that job or career. It's sucking all of your good attitude and motivation and desire. It, it's just sucking the life out of you. You're not able to get to your, your goals, dreams, and desires, right? It's, it's training you so much that you feel like you have no time 
once you finally get home. So you know who you are. I'm not, you know, calling names, but you know who you are. Or those of you that are watching that are new to this channel, you've been watching for a while, you're in this situation where you might be in a toxic work environment, but you're kind of chained because of the money, right? And it, it puts keeps a roof over your head and that kind of a thing. I really encourage taking a leap of faith, emotional, but also a logical plan on how we're gonna take that leap of faith and go into the next chapter of your life. The way that looks like for me is increasing your skills in something or potentially pivoting into another industry that might be booming, that you may have some starter entry level skills and that you could get hired. And maybe there could be a replacement in income, right? So if you're making 50 grand a year here and you can go to this job where maybe it's slightly less or maybe slightly more of the same, 50 grand, but the work environment's gonna be much better and the potential to grow is much higher you really should consider that. But I think a lot of us have fear, like we're not good enough or something. Like I, you know, I've talked to clients before where they're like, Denzel, you don't understand. And I'm like, no, I don't. You're right. I don't understand. I'm 27 years old, but if I was in your shoes, this is what I would do. I would be listening to podcasts to and from my job. I would, I would stop listening to music. I would stop watching TV. I would stop inject, injecting junk in my brain for the next six to nine months, pick up a skill, start making relationships, with people that make more money than me, that are living the life that I wanna live, and I'm gonna spend as much humanly time as I possibly can with them, and I'm gonna maximize all the free time that I have, and I'm gonna sleep maybe 30 minutes less, get up, get up 30 minutes earlier before I start my day to get the right framework, get the right education I need, send that email out, connect with that person I need to connect with to get me to the next level. I'm willing to sacrifice now to have bigger gains later on. So these are the things that you might wanna consider right? Pivot and leave. Build strong relationships. If you're not in a toxic environment, you're in a good work environment. Like now's the time to level up. Now's the time to level up. So many people don't want to work right now. They want three day work weeks. They want four day work weeks. They want to work from home. You know, they want to, you know, chill and take more breaks and take more vacations. Now is the time to secure the bag when nobody's fighting for it. It's crazy. Nobody's fighting for it right now. Nobody's like competing for it. Like competition is so low in many industries. If you're like ground level employee, if you're at the entrepreneur level, it's totally different, right? But I'm talking like employee. Like if, like if I had to go and be an employee today, I would go find me a high level entrepreneur, high performing CEO. And I do everything in my power to get within proximity of that CEO, of the managers, the regional managers, the CFO, the COO, and, and acquire favor from these people. Favor gives you an unfair advantage in the marketplace, right? Me personally, as a, I'd say a lower level entrepreneur, multiple six figures, I would say high level are entrepreneurs, business owners that are doing like seven, eight, nine, ten 10 figures a year. Those are like high level entrepreneurs to me, right? So I'm here, multiple six figure entrepreneur. And then these, you can't even see them. They're like just all the way up here. Right? So what I do to increase my value, become more of an asset to those people is I figure out how can I give to that person that has so much, right? How can I give to that person that has so much that don't, they don't need anything, right? I, I process this. I think of different ways of, of serving that kind of a person, right? Then what happens over time, I get within proximity of where these people are going. I go to their networking events. I go to their masterminds. I show up on time. I do everything in my power to show up on time. It's one of the things that I've worked on in, in my uh, years is showing up on time for things, right? That's a cultural thing that I learned growing up. We show up late. Spanish people were always late, right? 30 minutes, hour late to the party. Party don't actually start till an hour after they said to show up, right? It's a cultural thing. So I'm, I'm breaking that personally over, over these years. So being able to show up on time, go above and beyond, give tremendous value, all these things over and over again until I get within proximity and then they drop favor on you. They just drop favor. They're saying, hmm, I wanna spend time with this guy. And then they do things like they they bless me with mentorship or they bless me with more clients or they, they bless me with knowledge and wisdom. They bless me with access, right? They put me in rooms I'm not even qualified to be in. They, they send me clients that are smarter than me, right? On so many levels. I'm like, how can I even help this person? Right. And they're just, they're just sending so much value that results in, you know, income increasing, wisdom increasing, confidence increasing, more viewers, more subscribers, more attention, more everything. How can you do that as an employee within a 
corporation, within a company, acquiring favor is one of the most unfair things you could do to gain an advantage, an unfair advantage, right? Because listen, life's not fair. Life is not fair. We know this. Life is hard. Life is not fair. Favor has nothing to do with fair. Like it's not even like a, it's not a, it's not a thought that comes in favor, whether it's favor from God or favor from high level entrepreneurs, people that are in higher places than you, just favor. And it's a matter of you getting within proximity of their sights with what they're looking at and being blessed. That's a unique strategy. I don't know too many people that talk about that, but that's something I've done for myself. That's going to allow me to explode in my content creation and in my influencer world where I now have the ability to text certain entrepreneurs that are just doing 10 X what I do in revenue per year, helping 10 X the amount of people what I help, I can text them and they respond within minutes, hours, right? Like not even a whole day. Like they respond I'm like, this is freaking cool. I can ask them a question, send them an email. I can book time on their calendar. They're willing to give me 25 minutes. They're willing to give me 45 minutes, fin minutes. They're willing to give me an hour. They're willing to give me access to their, you know, masterminds and their courses and their groups. We're talking tens of thousands of dollars, maybe even a hundred plus thousand or more of money that I've saved just because of favor, right? Now, obviously that favor comes with work. I put in the work. I decided to click the record button and put myself out there. I decided to go serve people. I decided to go do ministry. I decided to put in the time that most won't. And that results in more favor in the long run. So that's just really, really cool stuff, right? Recap, six months worth of expenses, get that 0% credit card, increase skills, build strong relationships, can consider pivoting from one industry to another to generate more income, to be more fulfilled, have more joy, develop your leverage capacity limits, All right? Watch my case studies, you'll learn about that. And that's my lesson, that's it. Any questions? David says, great strategizing, Giselle. Appreciate the type of advice for with the combination of IBC and Velocity Banking, participation, percentages, absolutely. Glad to help. Anybody have any questions at all? We got we've had like 30 or so people in the house tuning in. If not, I'm gonna I'm gonna close it out here. I'm just gonna wait a couple seconds. All right, I'll turn it to the board. So you can check this out. Take your notes. Another thing I can share with you guys for those of you that are in the process of acquiring a life insurance policy, I have two Word documents that I'm happy to send to you. Just just email me and tag this video and say, hey, you talked about two docs please send it to me, All right? So I'll, I'll share my screen real quick. This is just a checklist as it relates to acquiring a, life, a whole life insurance policy for yourself, questions you wanna ask the agent and questions for yourself. All right, so I can run through it real quick. So when you're talking to the agent, have them explain their process to you in detail. Do you have chemistry with the agent? How does the agent handle objections, legitimate questions? Do they respond with anger? Do they pivot? Do they give you some weird analogy about a grocery store? right? Or do they just answer the darn question that you have, right? Will the agent take time to hear your problems and concerns? Does the agent plan on being in the business for their whole career? Like, do they, do they love what they do? Or is it just a stepping stone for them? If so, you can ask them, well, who is your team? In case you leave the industry, I just want to know that there's someone else that I can talk to about my policy because, because this is a whole life policy and I plan on having it my whole life. I want to make sure there's someone I can connect with, talk to, to uh, strategize over different ideas, right? So in case they leave the industry, who do you contact next to provide support on your policy or policies, right? For you, am I thinking long-term or short-term? How much cash flow do you have per year? What is your minimum number you can pay in per year with your eyes closed? If you cash flow $2,000 a month, that's $24,000 a year, you could easily fund a policy at, you know, five to 10K a year with your eyes closed. So we could set the base premium to a low number of like, send anywhere from like two to three, 4,000 bucks, right? Maybe even less than that, which would be like minimum required to pay in. And then you have a desire to pay in 15,000 a year, right? So where do we set that? base premium at, like we can do it really low. How long do you wanna max fund it, right? If you're, if you're 30 years old, do you, you know, ideally you should think long-term, like, hmm, maybe I could, realistically, I could probably fund this thing for the next 30 years, right? Build a massive 
savings plan for years to come. What is the strategy once the policy is fully funded? Are you planning on dumping in a bunch of money and then borrowing it out immediately to go do a move? Okay, what does that look like? Let's run the numbers on the interest costs, right? What is the strategy while you are funding the policy? Think about these different things before you just go and put a policy in place, right? And these are other products and services. Think of stacking on top of the policy as you grow with the policy. So health savings account, annuity, long-term care, disability, Roth, real estate, state planning, legacy, wills and trusts, great things. This just talks about about the industry of how most agents design policies. And again, the lower the base premium is, the lower the commission will be for the agent. The higher the base premium is, the higher the agent's commission will be. So that automatically provides an incentive for the agent to provide a higher base premium, which would result in a lower cash value starting for you. So if you're someone that says, hey, I wanna have as much cash value as possible in the first couple of years, then you probably don't want a, a policy that has 40, 50% of your money going to base premium. But if you're someone that's like, hey, I you know, would like more death benefit, but also high cash value, maybe there's a, a in-between, like a 25-75 split or 20-80 split, right? Where out of 50 grand, only 15 to 25% is going to the base and then the rest to cash because you want a higher death benefit or you want to you want to fund for a longer period of time. All things to keep in mind. This is just a personal opinion of mine. Anytime you're talking to the agent and they're designing a base premium that's over 40% of your dollars. So if you're putting in a hundred grand and they they put sixty thousand dollars towards the base premium, that means day one, you're gonna have less than forty thousand dollars available in cash value. I don't know if that's advantageous for the person that even has the hundred grand to begin with. I really don't think they are willing to part with 60% of their liquidity for the hopes and potential that 20 years from now, there, there's gonna be more money available. I really don't think that happens. Most people I've worked with that have that kind of money, hundred grand and up to fund a policy multiple years, they want as much of that hundred grand as possible in the beginning years because they plan on doing so much more with it. This is another document that just goes over the infinite banking marketing terms so that you don't get confused, right? To understand that if you hear any of these words, that's just marketing. There's, there's, it's just a marketing term or it's a branded term. It's a trademark term. The, the actual product itself, it's going to be a whole life. An L100, L95, a 10 pay, 20 pay, 30 pay, right? And these are typically the companies that most agents will use Mass, Guardian, Penn, Lafayette, One America are like the most popular companies that is used to design high cash value life insurance policies. All right, so again, these are the marketing terms, sacred account, your own family bank, dynamic banking, cash flow, tax-free banking, private banking, become your own banker, infinite banking, bank on yourself, right? Master account, uh, investment grade insurance contract. Right? These are just marketing terms. Don't get confused. That's just how they hype you up. It's really gonna boil down to these boring words right here. L100, whole life, right? That's about it. Here are the infinite banking players. This list, uh, I need to I need to add some people on here, but these are some of the names you'll most likely come across. You got Stephen Gardner, you've got Chris Crone, VIP Financial Education. This is in no particular order. You got the Quack Brothers, right? Uh, Seven Figure Squad, Matt Zapala, Quack Brothers, Sam, Daniel Quack, VIP Financial Education, Matthew Pilmore. You've got Wealth Nation, Carmen and Darius, Garrett Gunderson, Doug Andrew, myself, Chris Kirkpatrick, right? That's uh, Life 180. You got IBC Global, that's Steve Parisi, right? The Money Advantage, Curtis Ray, Nelson Nash Institute, Oregon Cashflow Pro, James Nethery, Banking Truths, Caleb, Jerry, Kim Butler, and there's more. Okay. And then here are the books. There's some really cool books out there on this concept that will really give you uh, a really good framework. All right. So you got become your own banker. That's like the OG book to, to probably start with. You got building your warehouse of wealth, the and asset by Caleb money, wealth, life insurance, the case for IBC. What would the Rockefellers do? That's Garrett Gunderson killing sacred cows. Also Garrett, Garrett Gunderson live your life insurance. Okay. Real quick. You want those two documents, happy to send it to you. Just email me directly and you know, no cost to that. That's just a, a really nice framework, right? Where it's like, I, I've got no incentive promoting any of these books, right? Or any of those content creators. I got some cool relationships and partnerships that pretty much know everyone on that list or have the 
I've had the privilege of talking to almost everyone on that list. And I would say those are the most credible people in the industry as it relates to the infinite banking concept. I would say those are some of the most credible out there public people talking about these strategies. And for the most part, many of them have a, have a good system, right? Good process, good system. Again, there were some people I'm missing on there. I don't think I added Chris Noggle. He's one. And there's definitely some other people. The list, the list is growing which is cool. So that just means like more credibility is, is coming to the space, which is you know nice to see. So with that being said, we're going to close it out here. I don't think there is anything else to discuss. I think we're completely done, right? And yeah, I don't see any other comments. I think we're good. I just want to make sure I'm not missing comments here. I'm just going to look on my phone real quick. Let me know if you've got great value comment if you got some really really good value from this okay yeah i'm not seeing other comments great you did a good job well, god bless you all again i'm really looking forward to meeting many of you in person at my first live event it's gonna be awesome those of you that are going to be on the on the virtual i'll be acknowledging you throughout the event if you haven't purchased your virtual ticket yet you're interested you want to spend and mastermind an entire day with me let's uh reach out to me. You can go to my website directly and you can purchase a ticket and we'll have a blast. David says you should have more people on this broadcast. Yep. You know, over time, it's gonna, I'm going to keep building, right? It was very good value. Sam, thanks. Great information. Beautiful. Yeah, David, I don't think we've had the pleasure of communicating or speaking yet, uh, but it seems like you had some really, really good value. And certain times of the day, there's certain times where I've had like, you know, a hundred people on the stream, different things. Uh, but this, this was more so uh, again, a, a more advanced video where it just I'm already assuming everyone in the room understands what I just went over the last hour and a half. And again, if you didn't just take the main points of the predictions and you can apply that to your learning as we go into 2024. So God bless you all. 